Nature parks truly have all kinds of strange and odd things going on inside of them. And these stories that viewers just like you sent in are no different. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true nature park horror stories that will freak you out tonight. Now, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Now, without further ado, let's jump right into these allegedly true and downright strange nature park horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Camping in a park was a bad idea. By Bama Girl This happened back in 2012, in Florida. I was 22 at the time and my ex was 19. We both had fallen on tough times and ended up becoming homeless. We had no choice but to pitch a tent in the woods and do our best to survive. We lived in that tent for about a year and a half. Unfortunately, during this time we both became addicted to meth. I know, not a great story, right? It's not the best background, but it happened, and there's nothing we can do about it, and there is no sugarcoating addiction. We had been living in our tent for about six months at this point, and our little tent had become a pretty impressive home base that we entirely built by tweaking. We ended up with three tents with a screened-in area to keep the mosquitoes out. There was a park about a half a mile away from our camp, and every evening different churches would come to visit this park and feed the homeless. So one evening, my ex and I went to this park to get food. We had been awake for about five days at this point and were coming down, so we needed food and a lot of rest. We ended up meeting a couple at the park, and they were about our age, maybe a few years younger. They joined us at our table and told us their story and how they ended up homeless. They told us they had no tent and nowhere to go, so my ex elbowed me in the ribcage and gave me the eyes. So I asked them if they wanted to stay in our extra storage tent. They took us up on the offer, being incredibly grateful. After all, we were all homeless and we needed to take care of each other. Once we were all done eating, we packed up our leftovers and started to head back to the home base. Our little setup seemed to impress the couple when we reached the tents. I grabbed some dry wood with the boy and set up a small fire in the makeshift fire pit. We sat around the fire talking and laughing for a couple of hours, and we got to know each other better. Soon the fire turned to a smoldering ember and we decided to go to bed. I gave them some extra pillows and blankets and we all said goodnight. I was lying in my tent in and out of sleep. It was an hour after everybody said goodnight, and at this point, I was almost delirious from the amount of time I had been awake. Then I heard a loud smacking sound. It woke me up pretty quickly. I was a bit confused because I didn't hear any voices, so I thought it must have been my imagination at first. So I laid back down. And then I heard it again, but this time much louder and this time followed by the sound of a zipper. I can hear the girl at the door of my tent pleading to come in. So I opened and invited her in. Of course I'm annoyed, but it is what it is. I gave her a pillow. Then I hear the zipper in the tent once again. Now the boy is at the front of my tent, screaming at the girl to come out of my tent. She refused. So what does this guy do? He unzips my door, grabs her by the hair, and rips her out of my tent. I'm no saint, and I won't be someone to say that I have never manhandled or put my hands on my exes in any sort of situation, especially in the worst of my addiction. But that night, I didn't have the patience to deal with these two, and I was not about to stand by and watch this girl get beat down by someone three times her size. I jumped to my feet and bum-rushed the guy. I had no advantage over him at all. In all actuality, I was the same size as the girl, but I was no stranger to fights myself. I grew up with five brothers. Being the only girl, they ensured I knew how to defend myself. I made contact with the boy. He didn't see me until it was far too late, luckily. He was instantly on his back, but he got up rather quickly, and I suffered one of the worst beatings of my life. I kept pushing him away, trying not to get hit, and I just kept myself between him and the girl. This kid was throwing haymakers at me over and over. Every time I hit the ground, I would get back up, and he moved from my face to my ribs. But still, I would not let him get to the girls. He struck me. I wouldn't get back up. I was just bloody and battered at this point. 
knowing I had some broken ribs. If things got any worse, I would probably die. And that's when I heard a, a, a screaming from the girl, who was trying to protect me from the continuous kicks to the ribs. This idiot pulls out brass knuckles that double into a pocket knife. The kid punched my ex in the chest, flipped open the blade, and tried to cut her. I saw the red come through her shirt, and I blacked out. The rest of the story is the recounting through my ex's words. I sprang to my feet and was super quiet. I looked at my ex, saw the wound, thank goodness it wasn't anything more than a surface wound, and I started walking around. I started to the side and found a log big enough to make an impact and small enough to basically be like a softball swing. I ran behind him, looked down, and stomped a stick to get his attention. I made him look at me as I softball swung at his head. He immediately crumpled to the ground. The girls were trying to make me stop at this point, but I jumped on top of him, grabbed the remaining log pieces, and repeatedly struck him in the head. I apologize if that is graphic. Once the log was nothing but splinters, I got off him, he was unconscious, and I grabbed the claw hammer from the front of my tent. I grabbed the hammer and started to scream in a demonic voice. It was almost unintelligible. I made my way to the guy, turned the hammer claw in. I raised the hammer, and as I was mid-swing, only inches from his temple. Both of the girls grabbed my arm and disarmed me. They didn't let me kill him, and uh, I thank them all the time for that. My rage just took over. It's, I don't even know how to explain it. There was nothing they could do for my ribs. There was nothing they could do for my rib fractures, my skull fracture. Everything was, was only going to be healing in time, essentially. There was nothing the hospital was going to be able to do for it. So, instead of killing this guy, I just called the police. We waited for them to come pick him up. An EMT took me to the hospital, and I got bandaged up. We never saw that couple again, and for days after that I could barely walk as the pain was unbearable. Unfortunately, I can't really say that after this experience I was on my way to recovery. But I, I would get there eventually, of course. But it was the biggest eye-opening thing in my life. The Park That Rained Rocks by Heavy Metal Barbie This happened a few months ago. My friend, who is 23 years old and a male, and I, who is 22 years old and a female, were hanging out one Sunday afternoon. Since it was a lovely sunny day and it was near the end of fall and the cold winter was fast approaching, we decided to go to a bar or a cafe. We would get some beers and relax at the park to soak up one of the last sunny days that we would get that year. We bought some beer and snacks at the store and decided to sit on a bench at the park nearest to the store because we didn't want to walk too terribly far. The area I live in is known for having many beautiful gardens, almost next to every block of buildings. The park was tiny to give you a general idea of our surroundings. A few benches were next to a child's playground, and a basketball court was a little bit down the road. Buildings surrounded the park for the most part. Most of the area was covered in grass, but the garden was built, so underneath the swings and slides there were tiny white rocks, little, but they were rocks nonetheless. We were the only people there for easily 10 or 20 minutes. None of the other benches were occupied, no other kids were on the playground, it was just peace and quiet. Suddenly, we noticed this man running extremely fast in our direction. At first, we didn't think much of it. Maybe he was just running after his dog or something of the like so we kept minding our business. Suddenly, he stopped abruptly as soon as he got to the playground. Now, I was a bit confused at this point, but very quickly my confusion turned into fear when I saw this man pick up a handful of rocks and throw them everywhere while making bizarre grunting noises and screaming. I looked over at my friend and told him that I wanted to leave immediately. This guy was twacked out of his mind. He said he wasn't sure if this was a good idea since the man had not noticed us yet. And if we just got up and left, he could see us and decide to attack us. We sat there for a few more minutes watching this man, hoping he would go and not notice us. But, to our luck, of course he noticed us. And as soon as he saw us, he ran exceptionally quickly, got very close to our faces, and started flailing his arms at us, still making these weird grunting noises. We just looked at each other, quickly grabbed our stuff and tried to get up. When the man noticed that he stood before me, blocking me from moving... He grunted in my face very loudly. His breath smelled like absolute crap. I was so scared, not knowing what to do. I am not much of a fighter, and neither is my friend. This man was indeed way more potent than us. 
I seriously considered just putting my cigarette out on his arm to distract him and free myself from the trap he had put me in. My friend got up and took a step toward him in an attempt to scare him off. Luckily, this worked and the man backed off a bit, just enough so I could get up and escape. As soon as I got up, we started running away as fast as we could, hoping we wouldn't be chased after. As we were running, I noticed rocks around us raining down because the man had started throwing them at us in handfuls. Luckily, none of us got hurt and we were able to get out of there unharmed. We had a few scratches and bruises, both of us were pretty shaken up after that, and we never knew exactly what his intentions were. However, we both concluded that it was pretty clear that he had some mental problems and was probably twacked out on some drugs. The Creepy Trail Guy, a Swamp Dweller classic story reread, by Deadly Images. I'm a 20-year-old female, and I live in Michigan. I was 16 years old when these events happened. I am a substantial athletic nerd and go hiking on a daily basis, unless I'm feeling lazy that day. Unfortunately, I picked the wrong day to go hiking, and I met and experienced something I would not want to share or ever experience again. I wouldn't even put this on my worst enemy. I drove to my typical hiking trail. I go there just about every time I go hiking, and this day I saw a creepy guy who looked to be in his early to mid-thirties. Me being stubborn and hard-headed, I just decided to ignore them and continue jogging on the trail anyway. Typically, if you see somebody acting weird in a parking lot, especially to a trail or somewhere outdoorsy, definitely, definitely have a friend with you or at least some sort of protection. You never know what their intentions are. I took a short glance at him and started going on to the path. I got 200 to 300 yards away from the entrance and took a short break until I heard a scream. It sounded like a man was absolutely losing his mind, and then I looked down the path and my heart dropped. I saw the same guy from before in the parking lot running straight towards me, screaming. My adrenaline rushed into me, and I began to run as fast as I possibly could. This guy ran so fast that he caught up with me in no time, and I was a speedy runner. The guy ran like he had taken two shots of steroids and was a straight bat out of hell. I started to cry in panic, freaking the heck out. I quickly turned into the woods and returned to the parking lot area. I kept hearing his footsteps not too far behind me. As I kept running, the footsteps started to get slower, and I eventually was losing him. Once I made it to the parking lot and had any sense of safety again, I jumped into my car, locked all the doors, and immediately called the cops on my cell phone. Not very long after, they arrived and searched the entire area. They did eventually find the man. He was a homeless man, he was 37 years old, and they found a very big, rusted butcher knife in one of his coat pockets. I'm glad I did ROTC throughout high school, or else I would not have had the energy to be able to outrun him. He was faster than me, but my stamina was overall better. This is a short, creepy story, but it forever lives on inside of me. What Park Rangers in the Great Smokies Won't Tell You by Horror Writer 1717. I was a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It wasn't a bad job. The scenery was amazing. I loved to drive up Klingman's Dome Overlook and watch the sunrise. Anytime there was a thunderstorm, I headed for that overlook. One of the best things about the job is the autonomy. Being left alone to do whatever you want is kind of excellent but it doesn't come without its downside. This park is massive, over a million acres and 11 million people visit annually. I found out the hard way why the park closes at night though. If you've never driven through the Great Smokies on a cloudy moonless night, you've never experienced true soul-crushing darkness. Do you know those extremely bright LED lights that so many trucks have on the front of their grill blind you when they drive towards you? Yeah, our trucks don't have those. We have regular lights. The old, dull, yellow glow. The ones that make you wonder if your battery is going dead or if you'd be better off shining a flashlight ahead of you because you would probably see more that way. The AM radio in the Ranger truck spews out static-filled country garbage. It would be easy just to turn it off, but sometimes I feel like it's my only company on the endless black ribbon of road that runs through this sea of darkness. One thing this job gives you plenty of is time to think, and sometimes that's not always a good thing. 
I slam on my brakes to avoid hitting a deer. It glances at me, then continues to strut across the road in no hurry. You're welcome! I yell out my window. The deer doesn't even pause. I swear the animals around here think they own the place. <laughs> I think that with a chuckle. Just to make my life more interesting, it starts to snow. In ordinary places, that's not much of a problem. In this pitch black mountain, it could quickly become an issue. It usually doesn't snow here, but there's a call for concern when it does. Most times, it's a freak occurrence and comes fast and heavy. This time is no exception. Within minutes, the road is covered. Already low visibility has been reduced to nearly zero, and of course it starts when I'm furthest away from the station, right in the middle of nowhere. I slow to a crawl, knowing it will take me forever to get back, but at least I'll get there in one piece instead of sliding off a mountain to my fiery, gory death. I hope. I turn on my windshield wipers in a futile attempt to keep visibility. They work almost as well as the radio, honestly. The defroster and the wipers fight a losing battle against the onslaught of snow. I would just pull over and wait it out, but out here I don't want to end up buried in snow for days waiting for someone to come plow me out. Each station has one snow plow. I don't remember when it was used last. Suddenly I look out the front of the truck and remember that I am actually driving the only truck with the mount for the plow. Translation, I need to get back because there's no one coming to get me. As that positive thought rattles through my head, I come to a turn I see just in the nick of time. I have just enough time to wrench the wheel hard to the right and stay on the road. My tires and the deepening snow disagree on which way the truck is going and I end up sliding toward the edge. I jump on the brakes in a panic, causing them to join the direction argument. In the end, momentum wins. I slide closer to the rail that I know won't keep me from diving hundreds of feet to my death. I'd love to say that my life flashed before me, but all I could do was see that damn snow. I'm going to die surrounded by irritatingly blinding white snow. With nothing else to do, I close my eyes and pray. Time slows as I begin to bargain with my maker. The usual stuff, I'll be better, I'll give my life to the church, I'll become a priest, a missionary, whatever you freaking want as long as you save my life. I felt a heavy thump. This is it, I think. I'm going over the edge. As a desperate last-ditch thought, I opened my door and threw myself out into the road. I land hard, like a belly flopper on asphalt. The wind escapes my chest and refuses to come back. I lay there rocking back and forth in the cold on the white road, hoping that, by some bizarre twist of fate, someone else doesn't come along and run me over. Seconds turn to minutes as I lay there watching the snow in its relentless downpour, waiting for my breath to return. Eventually, I come around and painfully rise to my feet. The truck sits idling as if nothing has happened. I reach in and put it in park, feeling embarrassed and stupid for getting myself in such a panic. I grab my flashlight and go to the front of the truck to see the damage. I'm surprised to find the front bumper sitting four feet from the rail. I know I hit something, I say to myself, examining the fence and finding it undamaged. I turn the light to my bumper and find it's been bent slightly at the end. My light flashes back and forth between the entire guardrail and the damaged bumper. What the hell? As my brain wraps around this puzzle, another piece falls into place. I see patches of hair on the bumper and red in the snow. As I pursue the matter, I know the imprint of a large animal lying in the snow in front of my truck is probably not the best idea to investigate. I pull out my phone and take a picture. The impression it made was massive. This thing is at least as tall as the car is vast, even more significant. Great, I hit a bear, I say sarcastically. I sigh as I see the trail of red heading off into the trees beside the road. Guess I should go check on it. I return to my truck, grab my coat and the keys, then head after my quarry. The red is becoming difficult to track through the deepening snow. The tracks themselves seem odd. They're too close together, it's almost like as if this bear is walking on its hind legs. But why would it do that? Did it hurt its paw or something? I approach the edge of the woods, still following the red tracks. I don't want to go too far into the woods. I'm hoping I can catch a quick glimpse of the bear alive and well, looking a paw, but otherwise okay. Trekking through the dark woods in a snowstorm isn't part of the plan to keep me alive long enough to retire. As I follow the tracks further, I notice something else about them. They don't look like bear's tracks. If I would say they look like anything, I'd say more like large dog tracks but they're way too big to be any normal dog I've ever seen. Even for a Malamute or a St. Bernard, these are massive. I step into the woods, not intending to go much further, and a flash... 
and flash the light around a little bit. I notice the path continues going slightly uphill. <laughs> nope, I say. Not tonight. I turn and head back to the truck when I hear a low, guttural growl. I slowly turn around and see red glowing eyes staring at me from behind a tree. I shine the light in their direction and see that there are tracks that lead right up to a tree that hides all but the eyes of this creature. It's massive. The eyes must be eight feet off the ground. I've never seen anything like this and I still haven't seen it. Just the eyes at this point. In my terrified stupor, I do the least likely thing possible. I pull out my phone and take a picture. The flash makes it blink but also appears to make it even more angry. It starts toward me. I would love to say that I was calm, relaxed, and collected as I returned to my vehicle and was on my merry way, but that didn't happen at all. I screamed and turned to run, but my boots were slippery and I fell, nearly hitting my head on a rock. As I gain traction and speed, I hear heavy footsteps behind me. No need to turn and look, I know what's coming after me. Oh dear god, oh dear god, oh dear god, oh dear god. I know I'm not going to make it. I do the one thing I don't want to do. I glance back. A massive mound of fur is galloping toward me, its red eyes glowing with malice. It's coming so fast that it'll overtake me at any second. No matter how fast I try to go, there's no way I'm going to get to my truck. My panicked mind runs through a myriad of options. From just give up to turn and command it to stop to throw the flashlight hoping it will fetch it and give you time to get inside the car. The moment of truth arrives. I'm almost to the truck but I can feel its hot breath going down my neck at this point. I'll never make it around the corner. I'll try to think back to all those dinosaur movies I've seen and how they escaped. My mind reminds me that many of them ended up as a dino snack before the film was done. I sarcastically thank my brain for the happy thought and chose the one tactic that the movies always seem to show to be successful. I slid under the truck. I'm barely on the ground until I hear a loud bang. The car lurches to the side. A massive snout shoves itself far under the truck as it can and it sniffs. I try to ease my way out from under the car, but, but the nose disappears and reappears on the other side. This time, there are also claws pawing at me, trying to get a hold of me. I shimmy away from them, only to have them show up on the other side. Back and forth we go, like a demented seesaw. Front, back, sides, wherever I go, it's right there trying to grab me. After an eternity of this game, it tries something new. The paws disappear and I feel the truck springs compress. It's climbed on top of the truck. Shoot now can see no matter where I go. I test my theory by shining my flashlight toward the back of the truck. It instantly appears and tries to shove its snout under, snapping at me. I push further toward the front. It returns to its vanguard on top of the truck. I lay as still as possible for an eternity, trying not to move, barely breathing, hoping it will lose interest in me and return to the woods. My waiting game ends when I realize the snow is almost up to the level of the truck's frame. I'm going to lose visibility soon. I know I need to do something. I come up with a desperate and stupid plan. I shine my light at the back of the truck, causing the creature to jump down and claw at me. At the same time, I dig some snow away from the front of the car to regain visibility. Then I do the same in reverse. I shine the light at the front and dig at the back. Next, I execute the most desperate and stupid part of my plan. I threw the lit flashlight toward the front of the car and it bounces near the guardrail and, for a moment, it looks like it's going to hit and bounce back. I freeze in fear as it takes one more bounce then disappears over the side. The creature leaps down but doesn't shove its snout under the truck. It jumps the guardrail and disappears. I gasp in astonishment that my plan has worked. I lay there and marveled for a second. Then my mind kicks my ass. What the hell are you still lying here for? Get in the truck! I jump up hitting my head on the car's underside, then roll up on the driver's side, yank on the door and of course it's locked. I fumble with my keys just like I've seen in every horror movie ever. I wondered how those people could suddenly forget how to use a key, and now I know. After several failed attempts, I finally opened the door and threw myself inside. I started it up, slammed it into reverse, and hit the gas and nearly did a complete 360 as the tires fight for traction in the snow that has accumulated around. I take a deep breath and compose myself before giving it a little gas, just enough to get moving and get myself back on the road. This leads me to my next problem. The road is gone. All that remains is a blanket of white. Sweat forms on my brow as I start down the road, steering by measuring the distance of the trees to the bank spot that used to be a road. I crawl down the mountain this way, slowing to a near stop whenever there is a curve. Unfortunately, it's the Smoky Mountain, so it's all curves. An hour later, I'm no closer to the station. However, a minor miracle happens. The snow stops. I'm so ecstatic, I'm nearly jumping in my seat. I might even make it home alive. 
I glanced in my rear view mirror and those hopes are dashed instantly. In the distance, I see glowing red eyes, and they are getting closer. My veins turn to ice as I press down on the accelerator. After sliding through a turn, barely remaining in control of the vehicle, I realize I can't outrun it. I slow, but only a little bit. On the few straight spots in the road, I speed up but then slow down when I get to a curve. Consecutive stretches are the only time I can afford a glance in the mirror. Each time I do, the eyes are still there and they are a bit closer. I inch closer to the station, clinging to the desperate hope that I can make it there before this thing catches and devours me. I look at my odometer and realize I'm only five miles from the station. It might as well be a million. I sigh. As I look back and see the eyes have become considerably more significant. There's a sharp turn coming up. I know I have to slow down for it. I know that things will catch up when I do. I also know there's a steep drop off at this turn. I'm stuck. No matter what I do, it's going to end badly. I do what has to be done. I slow down enough to keep from sliding off the edge. When I straighten out, I glance back and the eyes are gone. Could it have slipped off the edge? My hopes rise and then suddenly plummet as I see the red eyes beside me. The monster is running beside the truck. It slams into the door, making a considerable dent. It hits again and shatters the window. Its snout dives in and snaps at me. As the snarling, snapping jaws of a death inch closer, I duck in... As the snarling, snapping jaws of death inch closer, I duck into the passenger seat. I do the only thing I can think of. I slam on the brakes. The unprepared monster goes flying forward as I slide to a stop. It shakes itself and stands, growling at me and baring its teeth. I jump on the gas pedal to get as much speed as possible to run it over. The truck leaps in the air as the tires pass over the massive monster. I don't slow down until I have to. After I make it through the curve, I look back and don't see the glowing eyes. I hazard a glance out the window and see nothing but snow. I can't trust the quiet. I'm so paranoid, I'm shaking, and at this point I think I'd rather see the blasted beast just to know where it was rather than this ungodly suspense. After a few minutes and many more glances back, I finally let myself relax. I'm only a mile away from the station, and I can't believe I made it. The truck explodes from impact. I feel like a bulldozer has rear-ended me. I wrestle with the steering wheel as I'm hit again. The car is moving faster even though I'm standing on the brakes. I look back and see the monster. It's pushing me. I look forward and see the guardrail crumple underneath my front bumper. The truck slides over the edge. It's not the steepest ravine in the park, but it doesn't need to be. The, the car falls end over end and then starts turning and rolling. It all happened so quickly I never took the time to fasten my seatbelt. I'm thrown around like a rag doll. By some miracle, I stayed inside the truck. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke to heavy footsteps and snarling. I'm lying sideways under what's left of the back seat. The truck is on its roof, and I'm lying in a puddle of glass and blood. The monster sticks its snout through in the shattered window and leers at me with its glowing red eyes. I try to crawl away, but my leg is bent at an unnatural anger, probably broken. Pain shoots through me as I try to use my arm to push out. Ultimately, I realize there's no escape. No fight left in me, I lay there and waited for the inevitable. It sniffs at me and drool drips from its mouth as its putrid breath assaults me. This is it. I close my eyes and wait. Nothing happens. I open my eyes and it's gone. I painfully turn to see if it's playing some game, but I can't find it. What the hell happened to you? Says one of my fellow rangers as he sticks his face into the window. How is all I can manage? Looks like you're about to be the luckiest son of a bitch I've ever seen, he says. You must have rolled off the road up there and landed on this road down here. A few more feet and you would have been headed for another tumble. I lay there waiting for something else to happen. This is a dream, I think. I'm dreaming of being rescued while the monster chews me into pieces. Let's get you to a hospital, the ranger says. I wake up in a hospital bed. My right arm and left arm are each in a cast. It hurts to breathe. I'm pretty sure there are some broken ribs. The door opens, and another ranger steps inside. I see they got you all fixed up, he chuckles. What happened to you out there? Did you fall asleep at the wheel? I think about what I should tell him. I wonder how much he would believe, and then I remember. Phone, I rasp. He reaches into the pocket and pulls out his phone. I shake head painfully. No, my phone. He searches through my bag with all my clothes and pulls out my phone with several cracks on the screen. Pictures, I rasp. He opens the screen and navigates to the pictures. He looks at the last one and says, Well, ain't that something, he says. I'm so glad he sees it. I can tell my story and have proof of everything I see. He turns the phone towards me. All I see in the picture is white. The flash was on. 
The snow wiped out the monster's image. He scrolls back to the other view of the creature's imprint, but the flash in the snow also washes it out. I'm devastated. I know what I saw and I know it's real. Isn't it? I turn away. I'll let you go so you can rest up, he says, then walks out the door. I'm not crazy, I saw it. A month later, I'm feeling a lot better. My arm and leg and ribs are all on the mend. I filled out my accident report. I didn't mention anything about a creature. My slipping caused a crash of the snowy road, and that's how I left it. I wish I could say that I've improved mentally, that I have had less nightmares, that I don't look out the window every night and see glowing red eyes staring back at me from the woods. But I can't say that, because it would be a lie. I know it's going to hunt me down one day. I know it's waiting for me. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true nature park horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button like it owes you money. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Be sure to turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free to do so and always will be. If you made it to the end, definitely let me know what story was your favorite tonight. Be sure to send in yours, I'd love to share it, and be sure to comment the code word glistening owl to confuse anybody who didn't make it to the end. The best comment will be pinned. I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.